Yo, yo, yo. <laughs> What up, F? S1, you there? Yeah, what's up with you, bro? Yeah, still with it, Ned. <clears throat> man, you know, it's 1230, you know, we're here on the West Real Coast, Talk, man. tap in, like, subscribe, follow. Real Talk right, Podcast. Right, right. How you doing? Oh, man, all is well, man, you know. It's cooler, man about it you know about to roll up some of this california green you know you know what we doing out here the law of the land hey, i ain't mad at you man what's how was your day today man oh man you no know, good man can't complain you know can't complain man work back home nah no work today man you know all right i'm on my thing on my schedule right now you know so you know but it's always work though even when it's not that type of work it's always some type of work going on man so you, you know work really don't ever stop really nah man sometimes that side hustle sometimes you know shit that that helped pay the bills too, you know. Right, 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 right. Yeah, man. So what's going? What's going on in the air, man? What you think is going on right now, man, in the world? I don't know, man. You like, you know, like we was speaking about earlier off the air, man. Um, you know, a lot of things changing out here in Riverside as far as you know. Uh, gentrification, you know what I'm saying? You know, they making it harder and harder to get a place to live out here, man. You know what I'm saying? Oh, you're talking about taking low end low end uh buildings and turning them to luxury. <laughs> you know. Yeah, pretty much, man. You you know, back in ninety what ninety what, ninety two, ninety three, man, it was easy to get a easy as hell to get an apartment on Magnolia or Adams or you know, just in the perim in that perimeter, you know what I'm saying? Right. Uh, Cal Baptist is buying everything out, man, and they kind of moving a lot of people out of the Riverside, man. You starting to notice a lot of people starting to move either up the hill or toward uh, the Hemet area, man. And you know, and we starting to lose, and we starting to lose a lot of the lower income apartments you know what i'm saying you know the list is getting smaller and smaller well you know that's all about that by design though, right yeah yeah they kind of they kind of build this they trying to build riverside into like one of those cottage cities man like you know kind of like downtown la area you know like dodge stadium area like you know like you know, kind of like the same thing they're doing in Vegas right now, man. You know, with the, you know, with the new football team out there and stuff. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, you know, they just rezone it. So what happens is every so many years, places get rezoned, and when they rezone them, uh, the demographics change. So like, let's go back uh, history on Riverside. History, Riverside was originally a military city. Um, yeah. Once upon a time, Moreno Valley, man, they had all those. Uh, all those people that lived out there that was from the Air Force base and stuff, man. Well, they, well, they pushed it out. It was actually a military city. So Riverside was Army, right? And and, yeah. and they, they made real value, you know, Air Force, right? But at the end of the day, it came from in and out. So it came from Riverside out to Reno Valley, right? So yeah. Um, after so many years, like, when we was coming up, I didn't know that Fairmont Park was really the old um, housing for the tanks. And then when they- I didn't know that. Yeah, that's- I didn't know that either. That's why they have the tank in front of Fairmont Parks when they got done utilizing it for that. Instead of them um, taking and making it, you know, homes, building homes on there or commercial buildings, they had um, 
um, holes in the ground for your tanks going in, right? So they took, instead of back filling them holes up, they just filled them up with water. So that's how they got Fairmont Park and came up with the lake, because that's a man-made lake. And that's how it became, man-made, it became a man-made lake, was from the tank. Yeah, it, make, it, it make a lot of sense when you kind of look at the perimeter over there, when you look at the housing over there, there's a lot of um, uh, single family homes over there. Right, so that was town, military so, housing. You know I mean? Yeah, that was military base housing, right? So. Now that's done with Riverside. They want to move it because so many people have moved in the area through time, you know. Now it has to be something else. So now the new kick is warehouse, you know. And it's crazy because a lot of people that got it um, ramped up to be a warehouse district, you know, Moreno Valley and, and uh, their Riverside areas um, were the Hispanics, right? Yeah. And um, when Trump got in, he put a lot of them out of position. So now a lot of these warehouse, you know, warehouses have jobs open based off of uh of of the of the volume of the employees. Well the employees ain't there no more, man, for these warehouses. But now people are saying, well, look, we have all these spaces out here in Middle Valley, so we can build these warehouses, a perfect area for it. But now they don't have just yeah. enough people for it. It's not enough people for these jobs out here right now due to immigration laws that actually messed up with the, the manufacturing um, business. Oh, that, that and the, the cost of living going up, man. You know what I'm saying? It's forcing people, a lot of people out. Well, it's forcing them, it's forcing them out. It's, it's, it's by design to force them out um, because after it became military, um, and it was expensive to live in Riverside at that time. And then after the military left, a lot, you know, the greater, you know, Riverside area, then uh, they, they provided low income housing. And, you know, a lot of people moved in from San Bernardino, my family, and, uh, other families moved in from San Bernardino and from, you know, further out from the LA area, you know, cause my mom's side came from uh, Fullerton and then my pops' side came from San Diego and San Bernardino. You know what I mean? And uh, yeah. so that's when it was a lot of brothers, a lot of, a lot of minorities when I was coming up was cause it was lower, it was lower income living to a certain degree right and it was yeah. based off of like necessarily um the people but it was just the time you know what i mean it was just cheaper um it was more urban right so now yeah. they've done away with all that because they raised the cost of living up and the demographics changed because these same people can't afford to live in this area no more um, well, i remember i remember my uncle used to say man you know back in the 90s to say by the time the 2000s hit you know if you didn't if you didn't have a house by then you wouldn't gonna be able to afford one if you didn't if you wasn't yeah and if you, like a million dollar like a, you know a million dollars worth of income coming in your house you know what I mean right 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 if you right moved these out, times. and if you moved out during these times you're not gonna be able to move back to Riverside so like yeah, we got a lot of people afford it yeah, you got a lot of people that, that we know that move out to like the outside area, Hammett, San Jacinto. They can't ever afford to move back to Riverside. Beaumont, Bannon, they can't afford to move back to Riverside because they nah. moved away um, to chase the, the cost of living, right? Yeah. They can't afford to come back to where they were from, you know? So we're really one of the fortunate people to still be able to be in this Riverside area and not be pushed out. Oh, it's getting harder and harder, though, bro. Uh, like I was saying, man, you know, I've, I've been in apartments most of my adulthood, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, I I don't know I don't know about me owning no house. You know, I ain't never had no house. I'm 43, you know what I'm saying? You know, it's getting to the point where it's like, you know, there's, there's only, man, it probably, there's probably like, maybe at the most five apartment complexes where they accept low income low income stuff man you know right now man you looking at a you know apartments that were apartments that were 750 back in 93 no they're cheaper than that like i mean 13. 
they 13, 1400 bucks now, bro. Yeah, they were actually cheaper than that. And I mean, I, I lived in them. You lived in them. I mean, we stayed on Magnolia, Magnolia and Madison. Well, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about like a three bedroom, two, three bedroom. Oh, right, 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 right. right, right. right. It's a one bedroom for about 500. Yeah, so you're right about that. Um, um, but now it's not. It's not none of that, man. You know, I think, I think, you know, I thought about it, man, and I, I was reading something earlier, right? Yeah. On our on our presidents, and a lot of people don't know. They think that the presidencies are based off of uh, who has the best campaign, who has the biggest movement, but not necessarily, man. Um, all of our presidents, all forty something of our presidents have have had high IQs. And right. a lot more, a lot more class. Well, no, h- higher IQs. So some of them were modest, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, some of them may not like uh, Abraham Lincoln. He he didn't have a huge um, education background. However, he had a high IQ. Mm-hmm. So he was naturally born smart. So he was. Um, so he's in that percent, in the one percent, two percent pool of the world. Yeah. Not one, and that was our earlier president. Now, the, our our recent, most recent president, uh, Mr. Trump. People don't want to recognize it's accepted, but he has a high IQ. His IQ, he's probably among the two percent with his high IQ. It's like probably over one fifty nine. They said in this article it, I read. It, about. Well, his resume, his resume is pretty high up there too, man. Being that his family was already rich, you know what I'm saying? It, right. He, right. He um earned his he he earned his uh, resume before he was even born. You know what I'm saying? Right. So but we're just talking about his intellect. Family. But we're talking about his intellect. Now Obama's yeah. IQ IQ was right around Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln was like 140 something. Obama's was like 145, 144. His IQ. So it's not been about the campaign of the presidents. It's been really about their intelligence. Yeah. Uh, by them being smarter, they can actually make changes, not for, not only for the country, but for the world. Well, I, I, I look at it like this, man. It ain't a, to me, it ain't about that. To me, it ain't about their IQ, man. It's about well, what they what what they can do. Because well, it is, it every is. every president we've had has has lied to get in. I mean, I, I ain't gonna even say that. I ain't even gonna say that. I don't even want to be mean like that. I don't want to say that they lied, but you know, they they ran a they ran a critical campaign to try to get in the office, and nine times out of ten, they never meet their marks before they get out of office. You know what I'm saying? Even if, right. You know, you, so, you get you get a president that do two terms. Well, yeah, but check this out. Well, if you have a president that starts before they get their two terms, like Trump, Trump actually started campaigning 30 years ago, 30 something years ago in the 80s. He was yeah. for presidency, right? Yeah. He was running a silent campaign. He was talking about it. He was uh, he was uh, doing his homework on it. Actually, he wrote the foreign policy in 1987, right? Yeah. Foreign policy in 1987, right? Now, yeah. another thing he did was. When he got into real estate, he was out of New York, right? Yeah. Now, when he got into real estate, he was he's really the pioneer of gentrification, man. You hear the mm. stories about tenants in New York saying that he was he was a bad landlord and he treated uh minorities differently, right? Mm-hmm. Think about that. He was starting at that time to take lower income housing and make them into luxury housing. Yeah, came low income areas twenty some thirty years ago in New York that he owned. They're luxury now. You know, so, it, it, it's so funny, he's it. really a pioneer. He's really a pioneer and a father of that. So he started it earlier. And it's funny you. It's funny you say that, man. You know, uh, our boy sleep. You know, what I'm saying we figured out that a lot of these judges that that are judges here in Riverside. They're apartment complex owners. They're slum slum lords. You know what I'm saying? So right. Not to be too, not to be too mean, but a lot of them they, they look out for each other when it comes to court, man. You know, he had an apartment over there on the east side, and he had paid all his money to move to the apartment. 
and before he got to move his stuff in he figured out some stuff that was wrong in the apartment some bugs and all types of stuff that they couldn't get rid of that they wouldn't get rid of now the other tenants that was there in the apartments they were illegal they was you know they were illegal aliens so they didn't right. want to make no big deal about it you know what i'm saying mm-hmm. so he, he was able to move them out to court because he said he refused to move his stuff in until they get this problem fixed right so they took their time they backpedaled so he ended up taking them to court right you know what the judge did now he had paperwork from extermination companies that you know that pretty much told him what needed to be done to fix the problem you know Right. They needed to put a tent over the apartment and do this and do that, but the apartment didn't want to make that investment. So they right. took him to court. Right. The judge the judge looked at the paperwork for two seconds and, and threw it threw his case out. And right. he had, told all, him he had, he had to, all he had all the information from all the, his documentation. Right. They told him to get his black ass out because he was working for his partner at that time. The judge now, was going- we we did a little homework on that judge. We right. find out that the judge is an apartment complex owner. He's he owns five apartment complexes, which three of them were slum lord apartment complexes. You know what I mean? That he didn't right. that that he wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing in the apartment complexes that he owned. You know what I'm saying? After we did our own work and stuff. Right. So you know, a lot of these judges, you know, they're that's what they do. That's the side that's the side hustle. They own apartment complexes. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. a, it's a hell of a hustle. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and, and that hustle is really is it's, it's about a system of uh, of change. Of they know, okay, we know this is going to happen. It's inside information. Yeah, right. And just certain areas are are coming into it later than others. So, like Chicago was regentrified, uh, you know, 20 years ago, right? Per se, St. Louis may have been gentrified. 20 years ago, right? Yeah. Now it's just now reaching the West Coast. The East Coast made it, went through theirs. Parts of the East Coast made it, went through theirs. Not all of it, but parts 20 years ago. Versus like now Detroit's going through it. Yeah. Through, uh, the fall of, of the, the auto industry, right? Yeah, yeah. You know what? I've been, I've been looking at a lot of, um, a lot of real estate, a lot of real estate, um, documentaries on YouTube, man, about Detroit. You know, a right. lot of those, a lot of those cities out there, they burned out. A lot of the houses are messed up and stuff. A lot of people are buying houses out there, man. But if you buy a house out there, you better, you better stay in it, cause man, they, they, um, they tear them houses up out there, man. It's, a, it's a good market. You can go out there and buy a house for like four grand, five grand, right. maybe two right. grand. Yeah, there's a guy I know. Well, a guy I know his buddy by the by the block out there, by the whole block up. And he's not going to put no money into it until the neighborhood gets cleaned up. It's kind of a smart. It's smart. I um I heard I heard Master P say something like that. Man, he was saying that that he had bought some real estate, man, on the side of a highway one day. You know, and he said he did it because he knew eventually that they had plans on fixing that town up. Every you know every town has their. Um, their plans on building up, building up, and building up. You know what I mean? And um, right, and that's the zoning plan. That's that's what the city. That's their zoning plans. They have plans every you know every ten years. They roll out for every city. Exactly. The change they make. Exactly. <laughs> you know, who, who would have thought Riverside would have looked this good? What fifteen years ago? Right. Look all right. up and down Adams, man. It, it looked like UCLA over there, bro. Mm-hmm. But like I was saying, Master P, he, he said he had bought this land, man, on the side of the highway, on the side of a highway, and everybody else kind of thought he was stupid for doing it, you know. But he knew that eventually they're going to fix that town up, just like they do every town, you know. It may, it may not be now, it may not be five years from now, not maybe not ten years from now, maybe not even fifteen. But eventually they're going to do something. They're going to fix it up. They're going to build a mall major mall they're gonna build a, right. a housing complex or something now if you right. own that land say you bought the land at we'll, we'll, we'll say 15 grand now 
15, 15 years on went by. They gotta pay him. They gotta pay him close to a million dollars to move because they needed they needed to to finish up their project. You know what I'm saying? Right, right, just right. Like, just right. like they did on Madison. Remember, no, remember on Madison when they was building mm-hmm. on the uh, Home Depot. They right. had they had all those houses around around by Home Depot. Right. That they wanted people to move out of so they could build that Home Depot. So. Mm-hmm. You know the people that bought those houses probably like in the '60s, man. They probably bought those houses at like 40, 50 grand. Now, yeah, but it's a, it's a racial undertone to it, though, man. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, it's a racial undertone to it. You know, when I lived in Milwaukee, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a city, man, where it's really it's really inexpensive, right? It's not on homes; it's more homes and apartments. Yeah. They're real cheap, right? Yeah. And there's a lot of stuff that's boarded up. So one time I was talking to a guy, he, his mom been in the neighborhood on the east side out there for out of Martin Luther King Drive, um, our boulevard, since 64, right? Yeah. And she was actually there for the riots. And uh, so actually, actually before 64, so about 63, she was, they moved there from Mississippi. Now when the riots came, Martin Luther King Boulevard originally used to be a street called Third Street. Third Street took you all the way on the east side, all the way to downtown. Yeah. Well, when uh, when they had the rights, when Martin Luther King got killed, right? Brothers went through, looted their own neighborhood. They had uh, they had nice shops in there. Pretty they had nice stores, up. right? They tore it up, right? But they didn't just tore up any businesses. They tore up the Jewish-owned businesses, right? Uh-huh. Well, them businesses, there was one that stood out to me on the corner by where I lived at. So after they burnt it down, then after, you know, years went by, they named, they renamed Third Street Martin Luther King Boulevard. Mm -hmm. They had a bowling alley on Martin Luther King Boulevard. And I asked, I asked my buddy, I said, hey man, uh, what's that building right there that's covered up? You know, it's all boarded. The building looked nice, but it just had boards over the windows. Yeah. And he said, well, actually, man, there's nothing wrong in that building. It's actually got the original lanes. It used to be a bowling alley. There was a bowling alley in the basement mm. and a bar on top. And he said it has original lanes from the 60s in there still and the original bar. Wow. The dude won't open it up and he won't sell the building. He said he's saving, he's saving it. He's, he's saving it all. Well, that's the racial money in the now, Well, now the building's owned by a Jewish guy. So it's a racial undertone to it because this is in a black um community. Yeah. Right. And that building should be being utilized. But due to him not selling it and, and having the right not to have it open for business, it's really taken away from that community. Yeah, and he has Which, it, he I had it. and he has the choice who he wants to rent it to. He he actually Right. Has so it's not he hasn't rented it since the riots happened. This is in the sixties. That building has not the building alley's been closed since then. So what I'm saying to this is there's a lot of buildings in America and in certain communities that are like that. Yep. You know, I lived in Minneapolis. In Minneapolis, where I lived, I lived on the north side. And the north side, uh, prior to 1960, was a Jewish uh, ghetto. Yeah. The Jews moved out and they moved to another side of town called St. Louis Park. Yeah. The blacks were moving in from the outskirts, from St. Francis, from from uh, <clears throat> the Louvre from outside the city and they moved into Minneapolis and they, they got the old Jewish ghettos, yeah. which was the North Park. So it's just like now, what we're going through with gentrification, a next racial group of people are getting our old neighborhoods that we can't afford to live in no more. Yeah, pretty much, man. I, um, I, <clears> think, <throat> I think our family, as far as my family, man, I think the dumbest mistake they ever made was selling that house that they had over there in Casablanca off of Nova Scotia. That house is probably, the house the house right now is probably worth for just $600,000 already. Right, maybe, right. Maybe, maybe more just because of the community, because of the, the you know, the parks and the, the, the good schooling and everything over there. It's, yeah, it's worth, it's at the least it's worth that, at the least yeah. 600. Yeah, maybe, maybe more, maybe more, man. I know the house we stayed in right down the street on Margarita was smaller, um, and it was actually uh, one of the original ho- houses from that neighborhood. Yeah. Everything on Nova Scotia on that side were the newer, 
were the houses that were built 10 years after our house. Yeah. So our home might have been built in the 60s. Everything on your side across from Margarita was built in the 70s. Well, the houses that were built in the 70s are worth more than the homes that were built in the 60s. Man, I was looking at an article the other day and it was- To a certain degree, to a certain degree, depending on how much property is on the property, the house, how much property is on, our land is on the property for the homes in the 60s, you know? I was looking at an article the other day and it was uh, it was talking about in the future of home ownership in Riverside County. And it showed, right. it showed like a shack house, like an old right. tore down shack house, man. It was probably like right. a two bedroom house, man. It was tore down. It was mm. probably sitting on a half an acre of land, but it had the price under 1.2 million. And they were saying like, this is the future of Riverside, uh, River, Riverside real estate. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. and that's scary man to, to see numbers like that for that raggedy house because all somebody gonna do is tear the house down and build a, a complex there they're gonna build a multi yeah we're like right now, my grandma's house they can build seven or eight homes on her lot right now and you know the house that sits on there is not it's not a luxury home right but if they was to get that property they would tear her home that home down yeah and build whatever they want on it whether it was commercial our residential will be bigger than what's what's on there right now. Man, that's the, the and that's the sad thing about our own people that they don't even they their family, man. You know what I'm saying? Like, well, I, I just found my, out my one of them. You know what I mean? Like, well, I found out why my grandma don't want to build a lot. You know what I'm saying? The one over her there. Her husband told her. Bullshit. Yeah, well, my grandma's husband told her before, well, before he died, he will never build on the property, and he don't want nothing built on the property. So guess what she's on? Wow. She don't want nothing built on the property. By, by now. I talked to her about, I talked to her about it the other day, right? Yeah. And she tells me that she wouldn't make no money off of it, and I didn't know what I was talking about. I said, Grandma, I do know what I'm talking about, you, and right now you will make money off it if that's how you want to live. Well, if you dream low, you... You, you dream low, you don't make nothing. You don't, you know, you don't make nothing. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You know, if you if, right. you if you dreaming in the gutter, that's what you going That's you know, that's where you end up at. You know what I'm saying? Not to, right. You know, not to speak bad on anybody, but but our our families, man, it's, it's sad. Our families, they don't make any kind of future plans for their family, for their for their future family and stuff. You know what I'm saying? Right. And and, and it's sad, bro. You know, you see a lot of, you know, and I, and I don't, I don't have no dislike toward them. A lot of white people, they leave their kids, uh, houses, money, you know, put away and stuff, and ways to invest back into whatever market, you know, that they're invested in. You know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. most most black families, man, you act they act like they gonna take that money to the to the graveyard with them. And when the last time you seen a brain truck follow following somebody to a to a uh, you know to a funeral, you know what I'm saying? Right, right. You no, know, it, mm -hmm. it, it just don't happen. But they don't think that way, man. They they want to spend all that money that they can before they die, and that's kind of being greedy, man. I'm I'm more or less a type of person that. I want to have something that my son could give to his son. You know what I'm saying? Well, because a lot of us got about we got away from legacy, and if we don't have that, then we don't know how to treat it. You know what I mean? If we don't, if we don't say, well, we know this is our legacy, then we don't honor that. And that's what a lot of our elders they were bitter, man, from their time, from their bringing. I don't know if they they were given as much if they were shortchanged and from not being able to do what they wanted to do or not have as much as they wanted to have. Yeah. Right? Yep. But it made them bitter, man. It's you sad. know? It made them real bitter, man. It's a sad thing, man. But, you know, when my grandmother you know? passed, when my grandmother passed away, man, they was pretty much trying to cut off all the family. They was trying to cut everybody off. You know what I mean? And move away to where they, you know, like, it was like they knew they knew that my grandmother was gonna pass away. Of course she knew that. But right. they didn't make no kind of plans to, to Right. We're gonna take this money and we're gonna do 
we're going to have a ball with it. We ain't going to leave nobody nothing. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. Right. Well, I told my grandma this. I said, you know what? Because she don't really like talking about it. And, and and I told her, I said, you know what, Grandma, you can say what you want to say, uh, but I know this. The minute that you cough, the minute they know you have a cold, the black holes are going to be swarming around. They're going to be swarming around over here, figuring out what they can get and what, and what they can take from you. And she didn't like that. I don't want nobody to have nothing. Well, you know what, Grandma, you won't be able to control that. Because once yep. you go, Some, once you go, Somebody is gonna go somewhere. You don't have no control over it no more. Nope. But they, uh, but that's the way they think, though. Right, which is out of control. And somebody told me this. My uncle told me he said a long time ago. He said, "Man, if somebody tries to control you or control something, they're out of control because you cannot control people." It's sad, man. That people think that way, man. You know, family. So, but it's like family don't. There's, it seems like family doesn't mean the same no more to like it used to. You know, you you, you rarely see people even getting together on Christmas and Thanksgiving dinners any, anymore or doing anything together anymore. You know what I'm saying? They think about themselves, man. It's in the same. Yeah, but not even know if they're going to make it even taste that turkey the next day. You don't know if God going to get you up that next day. Yeah. You know, because that's what he provides us this every day. <sighs> Breath. Sad, man. And it, not the control of the time, so we don't we don't ever know when it's our time to go. Nah. That's the sad part about it. No, nah, we don't, man. And, and you know, it's silly of us to think that we're just gonna do, be this way and say, "I'm gonna be here forever," and I'm not ever gonna go nowhere. Once you once you born, once you're born, the next thing, the one thing that's certain after that, death. at some point in time, is death. That is certain after that. Once you have life, life death is certain. Yeah. <clears throat> so we're not the controllers of time. No, we're not. We're not, no. man. How, how, do <clears throat> so we, I, how do we change it though as a as a young as a mid young generation, you know what I'm saying? It's already been changed because we treat our kids differently than how we were treated. We listen, man, we know our elders are bitter. We know that we didn't like the way we were treated. We know that uh that it wasn't right. Right, so we'd say with our copies, with our with our with our curb, our carbon copies, which is our kids, mm -hmm. we treat them we treat them better, and we'll treat them better um, at this point in time than what we were, because we're evolving being a, a, a species. Humans are evolving, yeah. and we're not going backwards; we're going forward. Yeah. So if things didn't work in the past. We're not doing them things that didn't work in the past. We're doing what works going forward yeah them, them bitter ways are are left in the past you know so that's what i feel about that i just think it's changing through our two generations is that we're getting better through time well some are some are well, some are some may well you know because it takes longer for others to get it because you know it, it may take four or five generations for that for that lineage to be washed up some some lineages take longer to be washed up than others of all the bullshit you know you think about somebody that that they can't really came from a back from a uh uh from a uh a, a, a real bad situation or um not good people or just general it may take a couple of generations to clean up that. Versus somebody that wasn't so bad, they're already in the making. Their their next generation after them is going to be great. Yeah, you know? but a lot of people don't see that though. Nah, no, it's how it works, man. We are we are better versions of copies of our parents. Our kids are better copies and versions of us, depending on what they do. Depending on what we do, we are we are born better versions of copies of our parents. Depending on what they do, they're born better copies and versions of us. I'm gonna tell you something about how my grandmother used to be, man. She used to just just be mad all the time for no reason. Just sitting on the just sitting on the couch mad. Like girl, right, bitter. What, what you mad right. for? No, why why are you so mad? You could never even tell me why. Right. My grandma won't tell me why. I asked her what I did to her because she always has an attitude. She always she, 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 she 
don't tell me. She can't tell me. You know, you know why? Because it's something would hurt. And, and toward the end, it got to the point where I just, just quit even start. I just quit even talking to my grandmother because it was nothing but anger. It was always anger coming out of her mouth. That was it. And she didn't care. Right. About, she didn't care about nobody but James and James's kids. Right. And, and that's sad. And when that's usually how it goes, man. You know, something else with that. You know, uh, he was a bill. people. He was a care about the kids. Yeah, but people, people won't ever treat you. They won't ever treat somebody better. So, like, when you have kids, if so, if, so, if they go to somebody that didn't treat you right, they won't treat your kids any better than they treated you. Heck no. You see what I mean? They gonna, so they he went. They're gonna treat them a lot worse. So he went in our family. I had to tell my mom that I said, "Look, man, she because you know she told me she said you know." I don't know what problems, you know, grandma has with you. And she, you know, she really gives me, myself, I said, look, mom, she don't have no pictures of us in her house. But she has pictures of Pam's kids and Pam in her house. She has pictures of, of your brother in her house, of Dale and his kids. She has pictures of Angie and Angie's kids in her house. Right? Mm -hmm. I said, so we inherit your beef. Whatever problem is that your mom had with you, she has it with us too. Cause that's another thing too. Kids inherit their parents' beefs. Yeah, you're and right. Well, and that goes right. among family. And that goes among family too. You think? Let me tell you something, man. You think if if, if, if Lil B ran up on James, he would treat him right? No, he wouldn't. He's gonna treat him just like he treated you, if not worse. Yeah. He just would because that's, he would. He would. He would try to trick him somehow. Just because he's off of your lineage. Yeah. He you know, he's a direct connect off of you, which is a direct connect off your mind. You see what I'm saying? So that's what that's about. It has nothing to do with you. It has something to do with, with whatever him and your mom went through growing up. It carried over. It, the beef transferred from your mom to you. Yeah. That's all it did. And they don't they don't deal with us either no more. They don't call us. They don't shit. They don't they don't speak to us. They don't write us no letters. Nothing. Right. You know. Right. You know what I mean. They don't and, care. And, right. You know. And they're doing their self. They're they're doing what they're supposed to be doing because that's who they are, man. When people ain't good, they just ain't good, man. You know. And out of, out of, out of a bunch of apples, every one ain't gonna be the same. Nah. That's why I say one bad apple spoils a whole bunch, but not necessarily because not necessarily. you'll never get you'll never get a perfect bat, bunch of, of apples. Never. You know, and there's gonna have some have blemishes, some are gonna be rotted, you know, out, some uh are gonna be good, right? But you'll never have a perfect bunch of a, a, a bunch of apples, man. So, I mean, I don't I really don't go off of that, man. I mean, I just think that people are not the same all the way around, even if they came from the same family. Even if <coughs> you know well, where where you where you think the hate where you think the hate came from though, man. I don't I, I don't see that's what well, I that's hate, what hate. To, that's what I've been trying to figure out for years. Where the where the hate come from? From not being right. See sometimes when people ain't right they want they want to they want to make their wrongs right, and how they do is they start lying to themselves about what they did wrong in the situation and what problem they caused, and then what happens they start believing their lies, and all of a sudden you're wrong and they're right, but really they're wrong and you're right. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's where the hell comes in at, and they have to stick with it because they have gave so much to not being right that it, you no it's you no it ain't no it's you because you're the one with the issue. From the start yeah, of when you try to sit down and try to figure out the problem, they can't even tell you the problem because it, it's it's so. If they were able so, to tell you the problem, it's so deep. It's so deep into. It's so deep in the hate that they can't even tell you the problem. No, because if they were to tell you the problem, then they'll be admitting their guilt in the situation in the matter. Like my mom's problem with with the problem my mom, well, my grandma has with my mom, she has with her daughter. I'm gonna tell you what it is. She let my mom be molested by a man that she married. And she had two kids with, you, right? She and then to, after she, she had to live with that, you know, she didn't do nothing about it. She didn't leave him after 
the abuse happened, he abused my uncles, my mom's brothers, he abused my mom, right? Yeah. And when it happened, right, mm-hmm. and he didn't do it to the town. So therefore, that's why she doesn't have no problem with Pam. But she never did nothing about the abuse with the other sibling, with her other kids. So what happened was, through time, when he died, right? Yeah. This, the, her other kids had some type of resentment towards her for not them not rescuing her from that situation, right? And instead of her owning up to like, you know what, I was messed up, I was wrong, I, I apologize, whatever. Whatever she felt she could do to make up, she didn't do that. It really just take it to the grave. It really just take it to the grave with him. She just turned the other cheek on it, like whatever. You know, I mean, she was abused by the man too. He was an evil man. Joe Talley was a very evil man. I don't care about saying his name. He was a very evil man. I mean, I remember him as a kid. He, he passed away when I was about eight or nine years old, and. We, as kids, you know, kids see people differently, man. We wouldn't even go by that guy, man, because he had a bad aura around him. Yeah. He, something wasn't right about him, man. We'll go in there he, in the house and he just wouldn't look right, shirt be off, he'd be looking crazy, you know, talking to, like, we didn't even, we stayed on the other side of the room. We wouldn't even go near him. You know what I mean? We felt his energy wasn't right. So, you know, from her not being right by her children, instead of her taking on that and saying, look, I'm gonna deal with it head on and accept responsibility in my my role in this situation, how I then get them help and, and help them out of it fast enough, right? Or never help them out of the situation. She never did, right? Yeah. She just acted like it was fine. Everything was fine and dandy. Well, that's why she had the problem with my mom because my mom knows the truth because she had to go through that and, witness, and, and bear witness to that, that behavior and that treatment. You see, so I feel like that's the problem she has with her, you know, but right. she has a problem with us because we're her children, you know what I mean? So, but at this point, how do you fix that problem though? Uh, they, them two would have to fix that. My mom would have to deal with their hat on, on, but when people get older, they become set in their ways, yeah, and they don't want to be wrong. Their age tells them they're right. You know, I've been here longer. I know what I'm talking about. Well, not necessarily because there's an old saying that uh, the good, the, the good dies young, and the old old become fools. Yeah, because they start believing in their own lies after the, after a while. Right. So I mean, uh, sometimes you never the people never work that out and iron that out, man, and never repair that you know what I mean just it just happens like that you know I don't think they will ever I don't she I know she won't ever um admit anything wrongdoing or ever do anything to try to have a better relationship amongst them you know I know she won't you know yeah so it's sad it's more sad than anything man you know when you when you look at when you try to look at the future of your family, it kind of makes it look like the family's being tore down piece by piece. You know what I'm saying? It's being broken down piece by piece. Cause tap in, like, subscribe, follow. Real talk. Everything we bringing is real. I need a hundred thousand.